And last year, paradoxically, the U.S. was growing faster than potential, 2.5% where potential is 1.8%. And in spite of that, inflation fell rapidly. Usually it should be the case that if inflation drops so much, growth has to go well below potential. And the positive supply shock explains why that did not happen. So we got lucky because without those positive supply shock, Fed tightening would have led to a meaningful recession. Noriel Rubini, Professor Emeritus of Economics at NYU's Stern School of Business, Chief Economist at the Atlas Capital Team, CEO of Rubini Macro Associates, and also author of your newest book, Mega Threats. Noriel, it is so great to see you again and great to have you back on the show. Thank you so much for joining me. A pleasure, Julia. Great show and great to be back. Well, Noriel, you know, I always love listening to you and learning from you and having you on. And I want to start where I always like to start with my guest, and that is to get their big picture macro outlook, the framework the framework that they're looking at the world at today. And one of the things about this show, Noriel, is you can take all the time you need to set the table, if you will, when it comes to the macro picture. <clears throat> yeah. Well, there is a short-term macro picture of what's going to happen to the U.S. and the global economy, say, over the next 12 months of this year. And then there is a more medium-term picture. And in my book, Mega Threats, I talk about more the medium-long-term trends, uh, some of the risks, even if some of those uh, threats are already materializing, say, today, for example, climate change, among others. But, of course, there are slow-motion train wreck. If I had to start with what's the outlook for the U.S. and the global economy this year, uh, you know, there are different scenarios, and we have to figure out which one is more likely, but we have to assign different probabilities. Uh, scenario number one, that is the baseline for most people right now, is one of a soft landing, where uh, the Fed is able to bring back inflation to 2%, not this year, but let's say towards the end of next year, uh, without causing a recession. So that will be considered a soft landing. Uh, a downside risk scenario is the one of what people call a softish landing or a bumpy landing, where we could have, because of the Fed tightening other condition, a short and shallow recession. So not severe, maybe two quarters. But even a short and shallow recession, of course, has uh, significant, not just economic, but also political consequences. If you are an incumbent and you have a recession, the last year of your administration, uh, say Biden won, then you are really more likely to lose that election because whether it's fair or not, you'll be blamed for that recession to occur. So even a short and shallow recession that is not very severe from an economic point of view uh, has uh, political consequences that are quite severe and serious. An upside scenario will be what people refer to as a no landing, where in spite of the Fed tightening, uh, the economy continues to grow somehow above potential. And if that happens, then uh, inflation remains higher than what the Fed and other central banks are predicting right now. And then there is a real hard landing scenario where you could have a very severe recession associated with a serious financial crisis, uh, such as the one we experienced during the global financial crisis. Now, as of today, uh, the no landing scenario and the real hard landing scenario don't look very likely. You know, hard landing looked more serious risk a year ago when commodity prices were skyrocketing following the brutal Russian invasion of Ukraine, or in March and the spring of last year when you had the, the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and other banks, and then there was panic about a credit crunch in the US, and then there were spillovers that led to collapse of Credit Suisse in Europe, among others. So for now, you know, a hard landing scenario is unlikely. The economy has been showing resilience. And no landing scenario looks also unlikely because now we're seeing some degree of softening of economic activity. Uh, unemployment rate is slightly starting to rise. Uh, job creation is a little bit more milder than before because, you know, the Fed tightening and tightening of credit condition should lead to that type of a slowdown. So the question is whether we'll have a, just a soft landing or 
a softish landing with a short and shallow recession. Uh, the baseline for most people this year, as opposed to last year, is a softish landing. Last year, most economists, including myself, both uh, academic and market economists, got it wrong. Most of us thought that the Fed tightening would cause something of a recession. That did not occur for a reason we could discuss if interested. Um, instead, right now, people expect uh, this uh, soft landing. That would be probably the baseline because the economy shows, in spite of a slowdown, some degree of robustness. Consumption is okay. Uh, the Fed might be easing uh, this year. Uh, uh, other sectors of the economy, like manufacturing, look like they're doing fine. Softening, but fine. The same thing for the service sector. And therefore, you know, it doesn't look like unemployment rate is low. Job creation is still positive. Um, there's no real major firings and so on. So that's the baseline. What could lead to a short and shallow recession, the downside scenario? Many things. One is that uh, there's a debate on whether the tightening by the Fed, the pushing the Fed funds rate at 555, if the impact on it on the economy peaked last year or is going to peak this year. If it peaked last year, that means that a lot of that slowdown is behind us. And therefore, this year, the previous Fed tightening doesn't have an impact on the economy. And if the Fed starts cutting rates, even less so. Secondly, there are many households and firms and businesses that this year and next year have to refinance their uh, mortgages, their loans, whatever not. During COVID, they refinanced uh, at low interest rates because at some point, interest rate went back to zero. Uh, some of them locked in uh, long-term duration loans and debt, but some of them shorter duration, and those things have to be rolled over. They get rolled over not at 1% or 2% like when they were locked in, but more like 5 6 7%, depending on your credit rating, you could have a problem and uh, something of a credit crunch. Three, the Fed uh, thinks that the inflation is going to gradually core fall uh, towards 2% by the end of next year, but if it has a two handle this year, that's good enough. Uh, but inflation could rise, and the main reason why inflation could rise is maybe a shock to all energy commodity prices associated with something happening in the Middle East. Suppose that they current war between Israel and Hamas in Gaza where to escalate, become regionally involved Hezbollah in Lebanon, and then Iran will be directly uh, involved, and then Israel or U.S. strike uh, the Iranian uh, military facilities, then Iran can block uh, the Gulf, and that means that uh, production of oil cannot get out of the Gulf. They can have a spike in oil price by 50-60%. Or the Iranians could use missiles even to destroy some of the oil production facilities of, say, the Emirates or Saudi Arabia. So if that shock were to occur, one, central banks cannot cut rates, they have to raise them, especially if they affect core inflation. And two, it would be like a stagflationary shock that reduces growth and increases inflation and then makes a hard landing uh, or at least a softish landing. Maybe not a real hard landing unless oil prices double. But even a temporary few months of oil at 150 rather than 80, say for Brent, could push us into a something of a, a recession. So those are the three factors that probably one has to look carefully in assessing whether a recession could occur this year or not. Mm -hmm. So soft, softish, softish landing, the base case, uh, baseline for this year, obviously still some risks out there, and especially geopolitical, it sounds like. And you're mentioning to those interesting, the baseline that of last year, 85% of economists and analysts expected a recession. And you said we could go into some of those reasons and discuss why if if interested, I, I, I am interested. Can we um, explore that and why that didn't play out? Well, historically, when um, inflation rate is above 5%, and the unemployment rate is below 5%, uh, and the Fed has to tighten monetary policy to push inflation from about 5 down to, how to say, 2%, that tightening slows down demand, because that's how you create slack in goods and labor market, but then it leads to a recession. So for the last 60 years, all these episodes with inflation above 5, unemployment below 5, 
when the Fed then tightened and led to recession, whether it's mild or severe, depends on the cases. So most economists, based on that, predicted uh, that from happening. I think the mistake was driven by the falling consideration. During COVID, we had uh, not demand shocks, but we had mostly negative aggregate supply shocks. The impact of COVID first on supply of labor and production of goods and services, and disrupting uh, uh, supply chains. Secondly, another stagflationary shock. Stagflation is when inflation is high, growth is lower, was the Russian invasion of Ukraine that led to a rise in oil, gas prices, but also food prices, industrial metals, and fertilizers. And the third uh, negative aggregate supply shock was that until December of last year, uh, China, uh, oh, sorry, until December of 2022, China was keeping his uh, zero COVID policy and that was disrupting again global supply chains. So what happened last year was that the Fed was tightening. That should have softened the uh, demand and growth, push it into a recession to push inflation down to two. But we got lucky and we got lucky because the end of COVID implied that these three major negative aggregate supply shocks reversed themselves. So from negative became positive. We reopened, we could produce more, we could hire more, supply chains were restored. Uh, the impact of the Russian invasion of Ukraine on commodity prices uh, reversed itself, in part because there were new sources of supply and the risk that the conflict would escalate even further was contained. And China, about a year or so ago, decided to end zero COVID policy Therefore, their own supply chains were restored. So what happened was that regardless of what the Fed was doing, there were shocks that re reduced inflation and increased growth. And then what the Fed was doing was to slow down uh, the economy to reduce inflation. But inflation was already falling on its own because of this positive negative supply shock. And not only inflation was falling, but usually when you tighten it falls, you also fall output while the positive supply shock implied that output went higher. And last year, paradoxically, the U.S. was growing faster than potential, 2.5% where potential is 1.8. And in spite of that, inflation fell rapidly. Usually it should be the case that if inflation drops so much, growth has to go well below potential. And the positive supply shock explained why that not happened. So we got lucky, because without those positive supply shock, Fed tightening would have led to a meaningful recession. Mm -hmm. We got lucky. Um, so when we were talking about the macro picture, you mentioned there's some, you know, sh the short term view, but also the medium to longer term view. And that being the mega threats that you've also outlined in your book, which for folks who are watching and listening, it is a must read. The, the FT named it like one of the business books of the year. I think polycrisis was the word of the year in 2022. And it's a wonderful read very eye-opening. And so, Noriel, can we talk about the longer-term picture? Can you give us an update on mega threats? Um, what, How are those risks starting to transpire? What is kind of worrisome to you today? Uh, yes. Um, you know, in the book, I point out that leaving aside the, the short-term negative aggregate supply shot that, that now have reversed themselves, over the medium term, there are other negative aggregate supply shock that reduce uh, economic growth, increase the cost of production, and given certain sets of monetary and fiscal policy, they're going to lead to inflation and recession, therefore stagflation. Uh, and these are varieties of these mega threats. First one is that we have now a movement away from globalization, call it deglobalization, uh, call it uh, uh, the risking or decoupling, uh, secure trade rather than free trade, and so on. So everybody's becoming protectionist. If Trump were to be elected, he already said he wants to impose a 10% additional tariff on all goods imported into the United States, just to give you an example. Uh, secondly, is that uh, there is now from offshoring we've done to reshoring and friendshoring, in part again because of geopolitical risk and trying to uh, to say, de-risk our relation with China, that might be fine for national security purposes, but you are essentially moving production from a place where cost of production were cheap, China, to places like US and Europe that are more expensive. So you pay an economic cost, higher cost of production, less efficiency. 
So if you trade that security for efficiency, you get security, but there is a price. It's not a free lunch. Three, there is aging of population. Uh, young people produce and save. Old people don't produce. They're retired and disabled. So that leads to less production and more demand. That's inflationary and reduces potential growth. In the past, uh, uh, in spite of aging, we had the lead on wage growth because there was less immigration uh, from uh, poor to rich, US and Europe, from the global south to the global north. Now, both Europe and US, and we are seeing it, are cracking down on immigration. I would say that the immigration policy of the Biden administration they're substantially no different than those of Trump. And therefore, what was keeping a lead on wage growth in spite of aging is not gone. That causes higher medium-term wage inflation that is inflationary, increases the cost of production, weakens economic growth. Five, you have these geopolitical rivalry between US, Europe, and their allies, and four revisionist powers who are challenging the global order. Uh, those are China, Russia, Iran, and Korea. You have already Cold wars getting colder, already hot wars, Russia, Ukraine, Israel and mass that could uh, spread to the rest of the Middle East. Uh, and even US and China are in a colder war that eventually could lead to a hot war on the issue of Taiwan. Not say it's gonna happen, but the strategic competition between US and China is gonna get worse. I think everybody agrees on that, even if there is maybe a partial tactical talk in the relation between the two countries following the meeting in San Francisco between Biden and, and Xi Jinping just last, uh, last winter. Six, you have uh, uh, climate change. Climate change is stagflationary because uh, one, it increases, uh, say, lack of water, desertification, increases food prices, and two, also increases uh, energy prices because we're bashing fossil fuel producer, rightly so, because they make lots of emissions, tell them invest less, but the increase in renewable energy has not been sufficient to compensate for the reduction of production capacity among fossil fuels. Therefore, demand is positive and growing because there's world growth. Supply is not increasing. That's why St. Brent was already going towards $100 a barrel before the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So this is something more structural. Uh, seven, we have uh, pandemics for a whole bunch of reasons. COVID-19 is not going to be the last one. There'll be other ones. And those pandemics, as we saw during COVID, are stagflationary. You shut down economic activity. There's less supply of labor. People restrict uh, mobility of people across country, even mobility of crucial goods and services like uh, food uh, and uh, PPP equipment and, and so on and so on. Uh, then there is cyber warfare. Cyber warfare is a new form of warfare that damages economic production if you shut down the business of, uh, of a firm or a government, or you have to spend a fortune to prevent it, or you have to pay a ransom. And either way, then your cost of production are higher. Two final factors. One is there is a backlash against income and wealth inequalities leading to fiscal policy, rightly so, because otherwise they'll have a social strife, pro-labor, pro-union, pro-workers, pro-unemployed, pro-partial employed, pro-ethnic and other economic and social group that have been left behind and marginalized. That might be good, but increases wage growth and is inflationary. And finally, we're gradually beginning of process of de-dollarization because we have weaponized the US dollar as a uh, instrument of foreign policy and national security. Again, we have more security, but then country may gradually move away from using the US dollar as the global reserve currency. The dollar could weaken, and that could be inflationary. And, uh, and putting sand in the wheels of international commerce implies that all payments for movements of goods, services, capital, labor, data, technology, information become more costly. It's like protectionist, and that's also uh, stagflationary. So these are the medium-term trends that uh, are stagflationary. There is one good news. The good news is that while these 10 other factors reduce growth, increase cost of production, technology pushes us in the other direction, whether it's AI, machine learning, Gen AI, 
robotic automation, there are lots of other industries of the future, biomedical research, new energy sources, ag tech, climate tech, you name it. This revolution uh, over time is going to increase productivity growth, it's going to increase potential growth, and it's going to reduce the cost of production as uh, you can produce goods and services more cheaply. But of course, the impact of the AI revolution on growth, productivity, and positive deflation, deflation driven not by lack of demand, but by more supply, is going to take time. We don't know, 5, 10, 15 years. be slow motion. So in the short term, over the next 5, 10 years, there are other 10 factors that are stagflationary, in my view, dominate. And maybe if we can manage them and not destroy the planet, and there are 10 different ways to destroy our economy and the planet, maybe there is a happy ending with technology eventually leading to greater growth. But even technology is its own, uh, how to say, collateral damage. Leaving aside misinformation, disinformation, deep fake, risk of manipulating election, and that's to be a serious risk, uh, say, this year with the US presidential election. But this technology also lead to permanent technological unemployment. Uh, if you're a lower, medium value added, uh, blue collar, white collar, increasingly your jobs are going to be uh, replaced by AI technology and robots. And increase also income and wealth inequality. These technologies are capital intensive, skill buys and labor saving. So if you're owning the machines, the capital robots, you do fine if you're at the top 5-10% of the distribution of skill, education, human capital, probably you'll become more productive. But if you are everybody else, the bottom 90% of the income distribution and skills, gradually, I'm not saying overnight, your jobs, your income may become obsolete. So those are the, even in a world of high technological improvement, high potential growth, you need more inequality, more permanent technological uh, unemployment. The good news is that if the economic pie grows more, potential growth is not two, but four, five, six, whatever, then you can tax the winner, redistribute to those who have left behind, call them the losers, and uh, call it universal basic income or variance of the same. You can still make everybody better off. But it's going to lead to meaningful amount of permanent unemployment and permanent increase in inequality. That po politically and socially is not appealing, even if you can use UBI then to reduce the damage. Hey there, I hope that you are enjoying this interview. If you can, please take a moment to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel and ring the notification bell. This will keep you up to date with all of our new interviews and it will also help us grow this channel and continue to bring some amazing guests. Thank you so much for your support and enjoy the rest of the interview. But even to that point, Noriel, what about like the value that people have in their work or their craft? Because, like, you know, like what about like, you know, we were dealing with like deaths of despair for a while, like with people losing jobs. Like, how do you think about that side of the equation? Well, it's an important because, uh, you know, for most people, your self-worth is based on being a productive member of society and having a job and therefore producing, contributing to society, uh, taking care of your family and so on, men and women who are in the labor force. Uh, while even if in the world of permanent technological and poverty, you get a welfare check and you can live an okay life. First, it's just an okay life. It's not going to be a rich life. And two, you are somehow unproductive member of society. I mean, some people will call it parasite, not because you want to be, but effectively, you know, you're not productive. Uh, then the questions are uh, a little more philosophical. Can we change uh, our sets of value because the dignity of work, the way we perceive it, is based on a world where there is scarcity. There is scarcity of to scramble to find water, food, shelter, and then uh, as we evolve uh, more goods and services and maintain yourself and your family. In a world in which there is less scarcity because we can, machines are producing everything and most people can work zero or 10 hours as opposed to 40, 50, 60, uh, then maybe you change your values and say, my self-worth is not based on the dignity of work. I become a poet, an artist, a creative type, a caregiver, whatever not. So we did a revolution in our brains because our brains have been hardwired since we're hunters and gatherers and then farmers and so on. 
to work because the work is what makes us survive and thrive. So some people say that's, uh, that's, uh, that's fine. But as you point out, there are these deaths of despair because already today, even before the AI revolution, some of these technological evolution like the digital divide, trade globalization has made uh, millions of people marginalized uh, and having skillless, jobless, hopeless, wealthless, and some subset of them become uh, drug addicts, uh, opioid users, or users of excessive uh, painkillers, and uh, 100,000 of them die every year. So there are 2 million of them, and 5% uh, of them dies every year. And this stock is not going to finish, but it's going to increase over time as you have more people that are technological and employed. And what do these people do? They already are on some form of welfare, right? You're getting some welfare checks, some benefits, you're getting uh, healthcare, blah, blah, blah. But what do they do all day long? They play video games, so they are in this virtual reality. They use opioids or other drugs, so they live in La La Land. Uh, they are not really productive members of society, and many of them actually are incels, involuntary celibate, because if you don't work, don't income, no skill, no job, no self-worth, you cannot even find uh, a date or a companion or a wife. So they're angry, and many of them are misogynistic, and from time to time you've seen those guys going berserk, going somewhere and shooting uh, women. So, you know, it's socially just saying, telling people, uh, be there, get a check, play video games, go online, be in virtual reality, uh, don't have a family. One is not acceptable. And then eventually these people disappear. They're not only obsolete, but they cannot even reproduce themselves. So eventually it's a form of uh, eugenics where they disappear in the next generation. So still a pretty dystopian future where some people are lucky enough to be skilled enough, survive, and many more people eventually disappear. So UBI may not be the solution. Mm -hmm. But it's very yeah. hard to think about something else uh, mm -hmm. that's going to, you know, it's not. In the past, people said, if you get yourself educated and you are educated, there is a skill premium because people have skills, high school degree as opposed to not having it, college degree as opposed to high school, graduate degree as opposed to college. As you get more education, your income is higher. But now AI is going to destroy even jobs that require a PhD or highly skilled jobs like computer programmer or accountants and auditors and you name it, financial analysts. Those are jobs that require an MBA, graduate degree, where people make $100,000, $200,000 a year. These are not uh, low-end jobs. If those jobs disappear, then uh, the skill premium coming from education is not there anymore. And actually, initially, many white-collar jobs are going to be replaced before blue-collar jobs, because blue-collar jobs require robots. Our robots are not yet sophisticated enough to replace all workers, but Gen AI can replace lots of white collar jobs. So low value added and middle value added white collar jobs are going to be the first one that disappear. And those are usually middle income jobs as opposed to uh, low end jobs and incomes. So, so the consequences again become severe. You know, another topic I want to bring up with you, Noriel, is our debt situation. In the new year, we crossed 34 trillion for the US debt. I know this is an area where you have a lot of expertise and have done a lot of work around the world. Can you just kind of give us your take on the U.S.'s debt situation? I just want to hear what's top of mind for you there. Yes, uh, it's not just the U.S., but all over the world, in advanced economies and some emerging markets, public debt and even private debt. Private debt is the debt of households, of businesses and corporations, and of the financial sector is high and rising. Uh, and is an issue and eventually might become uh, unsustainable. So uh, in the US, you gave us the numbers, you know, public debt GDP is on a way of being above 100% of GDP. In some parts of Europe, like Italy, Greece, and others, it's already 120, 130, if not higher. And it's a, it's a serious problem because eventually that's unsustainable. It's to default debt crisis and financial distress that then has an economic impact because the credit crunch then leads to recession like we saw when the housing bubble and the debt bubble 
of subprime went bust and then we had the very severe US and global global recession. And actually in the book, my first two chapters of the book are about unsustainable debt. First chapter actually of the book is titled The Mother of All Debt Crisis. Uh, if you look at the numbers actually briefly, um, say in the 1970s, private and public debt as a share of GDP globally was about 100%, private and public. By 2000, the number was uh, above 200%. Last year, the number was about 320% and rising. In advanced economies, it was uh, more like 350. In China, it was above 300. For a typical emerging market, it was 250. But, you know, those emerging markets are fragile because they borrow in foreign currency like the dollar. So even lower debt ratio is risky for them. So these trends are rising and rising and rising. And my argument about uh, inflation, I believe the inflation is now going to go back to 2%. Might be zero next. But medium term inflation has to be more like five or six. And uh, the argument for inflation is in part negative supply shock that increase cost and inflation reduce growth. But there's the demand side. The demand side is that we run large fiscal deficits that lead to an increase in public debt. And uh, these deficits are structural and they're going to increase over time. You are fighting at least five wars. One is, again, the spending on military and security because we have cold and hot wars. Everything is going to spend more on defense. U.S., Europe, China, Japan, Russia, Ukraine, Israel, Egypt, Saudi, literally Japan, everybody. Because we live in a world that's more dangerous. So you have to spend more on defense, either to prevent hot war from occurring or to make sure that in a cold war you're not in trouble, or if a hot war occurs, you then know, you spend a lot on defense. Two, climate change and fixing it is going to cost us a fortune, trillions of dollars of spending to either do mitigation or adaptation. That's another spending. Three, there'll be other pandemics. So either we spend a fortune to prevent them in the first place, or if you don't do that, then expose, like we saw in COVID, the fiscal costs have been trillions of dollars. Four, because of all these uh, technological innovation, trade, globalization, some people are left behind, so you need a wider social safety net. Because if you lose, you lose your job, not because you're stupid or lazy, but because a technology makes your job, your firm, your sector obsolete, you need to have a, a safety net, at least transitorily, of unemployment benefits, uh, reskilling, whatever not. And finally, there's been such a rise as I pointed out in income and wealth inequality that everywhere around the world is doing fiscal policy to spend more on the on the poor and those left behind. So spending as a share of GDP is going higher. Taxes are already very high in Europe, but even in US. So spending is going to go more as a share of GDP than taxes. So the deficit is going to become larger and the debt ratio is going to become larger. And people in the private sector are squeezed, like household, if you're going to make mean, uh, 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 your goal achieved of spending, then you borrow to keep up with the Joneses, and that leads to private debt. Now, when the debt is unsustainable in the emerging market, uh, because you borrow foreign currency, you have no option but defaulting. You go bankrupt and then you restructure it. But if you borrow in your own currency, you have a more subtle form of default. It's not technically default, but you can wipe out the real value of long-term debt fixed income of long duration by having a bout of a unexpected inflation. Because uh, that unexpected inflation reduces the real value of that debt. So a form of taxation is a form of expropriation, uh, a form of redistribution of income and wealth from uh, creditors and savers to borrowers and debtors. It's not officially default, but effectively is a form of default. So both the supply side and the demand side imply the inflation is going to be higher because with debt ratio so high, if central banks were to increase interest rates uh, to fight inflation, not only get a recession, but you get also a debt crisis because we are in a debt trap. Inflation is so high that central banks cannot do what they used to do before because then there is economic and financial crash. So both factors, supply side I discussed before, and demand imply that inflation is going to be higher. And would that be them moving into like fiscal dominance? Yeah, yeah. The term fiscal dominance uh, 
or monetary dominance is based on this idea. Suppose that you have a fiscal authority that spends too much and a monetary authority wants to tighten to fight inflation because if you spend too much, there's more spending, there's more inflation. So there is a game of chicken between fiscal authority and monetary. So the question is, who's going to blink? If the monetary authority can credibly say, I'm not going to let inflation go higher, I'm going to jack up interest rates as much as needed, then maybe the fiscal authority says, wow, it's going to cost him so much, I'm not going to do the deficit. That's monetary dominance. But if you have a situation in which the fiscal authority is going to spend and do deficit regardless of monetary policy, then the central bank is in a dilemma because either they raise interest rates and it cause a recession and financial crash, or otherwise you have to blink, monetize it, and then wipe out the real value through inflation. But then there is fiscal dominance. So fiscal dominance is exactly what you suggested. A situation in which in this game of chicken, the monetary authority blinks as opposed to the fiscal one. The mm -hmm. deficit remains high, you monetize that you cause inflation. Mm -hmm. So higher inflation in the longer term. Is there Noriel, is there anything like when it comes to our debt situation, are we past the point of no return at this point? Is there anything that can be done to like, you know, rectify the situation or is it just going to like, want to just be really bad and in our face? Well, in the US it's difficult because, you know, also in other countries, everywhere is difficult because you tend to kick the can down the road. They are spending pressure, you spend more and your limits to how much you can raise taxes and therefore you create debt and debt is a burden on future generation. And if you care more about current rather than future, then you let future generation to be shafted. In the US in particular, there's also this bias. When Democrats are in power, overall they like to spend more, social spending, whatever not. But there are limits on how much they can raise taxes, so you have bigger deficits. When Republicans are in power, they don't increase overall by large amounts spending as a short GDP, maybe on the military, but they like to cut taxes and they cause deficit. So when Democrats are in power, you have bigger deficit because you spend more, you don't tax more. When you are Republican in power, you don't spend more, but you cut taxes and you still get deficits. And therefore, we have this structural conundrum. For now, uh, there is not much you can do. And paradoxically, the U.S. being uh, the global reserve currency can finance itself this deficit, domestic and external current account, for longer and cheaper because everybody wants dollars. If you are Italy or Greece or an emerging market, even UK, you make a fiscal slippage, the market punishes you. Suddenly your spreads go higher, interest rates are higher, your currency falls, and then you're punished and you're forced to adjust. Like it happened, uh, say, even in the UK about a year and a half ago. Even a mild fiscal deviance is punished and you're forced. But when there's no market discipline, because the US has the dollar, you can print always dollar to finance yourself, then the good news is you can borrow longer and cheaper. The bad news is like the market give you enough rope that you can eventually hang yourself. And once you hang yourself, it's going to be even more ugly. So it would be better if you had the market discipline, but there is not. So the fact that we can postpone the necessary adjustment means we over borrow and eventually when it's going to become unsustainable, as I said, we're not going to default. You're going to need lots of inflation to then wipe out the debt. So being a reserve currency benefits in the short run, but actually it doesn't impose market discipline. And therefore the political system eventually I think is going to uh, do something only when there is a crisis. When interest rates, for example, last year, 10 year treasury went from three to say 5%, then the market start to say, oh my God, the debt is too high and maybe it's unsustainable and that put some pressure. But then they fell because the Fed said, hey, we might start cutting rates uh, this year and so on. But over time, I think long rates are left to be higher. That may impose some discipline, even for a country like the US, that's one thing. Or the other trigger might be that right now, you know, we spend more on benefits of social security than contribution, but we have a buffer. We build up this uh, trust fund of the social security system, trillions of dollars, but now we're using it to pay for the excesses of benefits over contribution. But there are scenarios in which we're going to run out of the trust fund, say, three or a decade from now. Once you run out of trust fund, 
you cannot pay the benefits of current retirees. So either you cut their benefits, politically unacceptable, or you have to increase the contributions of the young, but then you screw them, or you have to lengthen the retirement age. So that may force. In the 80s, where the problems of security, we created a bipartisan commission that was at that time added by Alan Greenspan before he became Fed chairman. And then this uh, independent commission recommended we do some reform. So maybe we need a crisis, either social security or interest rates. And then since the political system cannot agree, and the Republicans and Democrats fight each other, and then they fight on the debt ceiling, and then they fight on government shutdown, but they don't agree on cutting spending enough or raising taxes. We need a crisis, and maybe we'll have a bipartisan commission that says, hey, we have to make sacrifices, and the sacrifice is going to have to be, we cannot just cut spending, we cannot just raise taxes. We'll have to be a combination of the two. And if we cannot do it, then eventually inflation is going to take care of it. Sure. But that's an inflation. The inflation tax is a tax. Uh, reduces the real value of debt. It punishes savers and creditors and redistributes income to borrowers and debtors. It's an unfair tax, by the way. Mm-hmm. And when you say inflation, have you ever thought about like the the ballpark of in this scenario, like what what we're talking about here? Is, like, do you have a um, like a number in mind, or is that just like too much to ask? Well, you know, in my baseline, uh, inflation doesn't explode like the seventies because in the seventies you had really severe negative supply shocks like Yom Kippur War, Iranian Revolution that led to doubling or tripling of all prices. I think that the average inflation rate may be, say, six rather than two. Now, it's not double digit. It's not high inflation. It's not hyperinflation. It's a big deal, two rather than six. But think of it this way. If uh, inflation is six, what has to be a 10-year treasury? It has to be at least 8%. Six for inflation and two real. Six plus two gives you eight. And then mortgages have to be 10%. And borrowing by households for their consumer loans or businesses is going to be 11, 12, 13%, 15, depending, of course, on your credit status. Right now, with mortgages around six, is already painful. Wait until mortgages are 10%. One. Two, uh, when the bond yield goes higher, you lose money on your bond. Bonds are not safe because there is a negative correlation within the price of the bond and the yield. And for example, in 2022, when the, actually last year, but not more 22, when bond yields went from 1% to 3.5, 250 basis points higher, uh, Treasury lost money to the tune of 20%. So in 2022, the safe asset is supposed to be a defensive asset, Treasury bonds, lost more money than S&P. S&P went down only 15%. Bond went down by 20%. And if uh, rates now are 4, and they're going to have to go eventually to 8, then anybody who's holding Treasury bonds long duration, think about $20 trillion of money, hold either by official institution for the private sector or directly by retail investors, you lose another 40% on your bond holdings. It's a huge market loss on a fraction of your wealth and portfolio that is significant. Those are supposed to be the safe asset because usually when equity go down, bond prices go higher, yield is lower, so you make money on your bonds. But with inflation rising, you lose money on the equity because equity prices fall and you lose money on your bonds because the bond price, bond yield higher means the price lower. So you are nowhere to hide. So the consequence even of inflation going just from two to eight, six are, are massive, massive. You don't need to have hyperinflation or double digits. Two to mm. six is a revolution. Mm. We could, with that, we could probably see, could we see more like Silicon Valley bank type um, moments when, when you have like the kind of duration risk? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, because uh, Silicon Valley collapsed because, uh, uh, you know, their liability were short term, their assets were longer term, and they had lots of treasuries. And therefore, when the yields went from one to three and a half, the market value of their treasuries uh, fell. Now, banks are allowed not to mark to market. Even if the losses occur, they don't... Uh, register them. But uh, in the case of Silicon Valley Bank, 
when those losses occurred, people started to take the money out of the bank. Uh, once you run out of cash, you have to sell those securities and you sell them at the lower market price, 20% down. And then at that point, the value of your asset has fallen relative to your liabilities, you have negative equity, then the run and the panic accelerates and then you collapse. So every time you have this kind of a duration mismatch, longer term assets and short term liabilities and interest rates on the long end go higher, then you can have a significant distress. And usually banks, their job and their business is a maturity transformation. You take liquid and volatile short term deposits and then you transform it in long term loans or by purchase of long term securities. As long as interest rates are stable, you earn the intermediation margin between long rates and short rates. But if uh, long rates go higher, the market value of those loans and those assets and those uh, securities is lower. And if there is enough of those losses, even if you don't mark to market, you're forced to sell. And once you're forced to sell, you can go bankrupt and then the run explodes. Mm -hmm. Noria, let me ask you about um, markets because we've seen the S and P five hundred um, continue to close at like record highs. And I, just going back to the beginning, um, I want to get your take on markets and have the, are the markets are they pricing in that soft landing scenario? What's your take on the markets? In some sense, uh, the markets are a rallying because uh, if you have the real hard landing. Of course, severe recession, debt crisis, stock market could fall 30, 40%, like during the global financial crisis. If you had the no landing, it's not good for stocks. Because in a low landing situation, growth is higher, but uh, inflation is higher, and the Fed is not staying higher for longer, as to increase interest rates even more. And when increase interest rates more, while the market are expecting cuts, the stock market falls. In a soft landing, instead, growth is uh, good, slower but good. Inflation is falling. The Fed can cut rates. And then uh, the stock market can go higher because you still have growth, but the interest rates are lower. In a softish landing, uh, you get uh, that uh, inflation is falling faster because you have a recession. The cutting rates is more. But since you have a recession, profits and earnings are lower. So you get a, a correction, if not a bear market. So a softest landing again is bad for the stock market. So effectively, the markets are in a situation in which they're thinking uh, growth is going to be positive 2%, maybe slightly less. The Fed's going to cut rates that the best of the world for, for equities. And long duration assets like tech stocks uh, get even better. In the case of tech stocks, of course, in addition to that, there is the AI revolution that is driving expectation of much higher growth of revenue and profits for these tech firms. And that's an additional reason why uh, the Magnificent Seven last year and even this year have gone up even more than the S&P 500. That's a structural tech story that we live in a world in which technology is going to do great. So you want to be overweight in those, uh, in those uh, tech stocks. So yeah, the market is saying... Not only are they saying there is soft landing, uh, the market today, the Fed has told us, uh, we're going to cut rates only three times this year. We're going to start mid-year, 75 basis points. The markets, uh, the way the Fed's futures are pricing it right now, are telling us that the market expects 150 basis points of rate cuts, so six cuts of 25, not three, starting in March. And uh, in his rallying, also because it's expected the Fed will have to do more cuts than they are saying. So that's another reason why the market is going up. But suppose the Fed is right. At some point, inflation is falling, but not good enough. Growth is still close to potential, and therefore uh, expectation of rate cuts sooner and faster and larger are dashed. Then you can have a correction of equity. A correction of the market. Correction mm -hmm. is seen like correction. a 10% uh from the peak bear market is at 20 percent or more from the peak so yeah. you could have a correction because valuations are high p ratios are high now everything is priced for perfection what people call the immaculate uh, disinflation if everything is beautifully immaculate like this the market for a while is right if instead there is any type of hiccup 
of growth or inflation, then a correction becomes uh, quite likely. I know you as someone who's criticized Bitcoin and uh, you have a a nice terminology for (laughs) those coins in general. You saw the Bitcoin spot ETF. Um, What do you make of it? You know, there were already the non-spot ETFs, those based on futures. The paradox is that, you know, on expectation of the SEC eventually approving them, Bitcoin prices were going higher. And then once the announcement occurred, they fell uh, by 10, 15%, depending on the day. Now, some of it might be the usual financial sector, how to say, approach, uh, buy on the rumor and sell on the on the news. Part of this technical, it was the grayscale was converted from close end to ETF, so people re- redeem some of it and so on. But my point is, uh, take the bigger picture. There have been 20,000 ICOs of this coin and token created over time. 80% of them were a scam, literally scam. People taking the money and disappearing, buying boats, Lambos, going to tax havens, God knows. 17% of them, the value is zero today. So 97% were either fraud or disappeared. 3% is left. 3% of 20,000 is 600. Uh, most of those uh, 600 have lost 90% of their value from the peak. Even the top 10, Bitcoin is still current level, at least 50%, depending on the day, lower than the peak of 69. And other ones among the top 10 are down between 50 and 70% from the peak. So yeah, they've rallied uh, the last year, but that collapsed so much between 21 and 22 that even the rally of the last year, you know, keeps them well, with, well below the peak. First observation on the risk that you take. Second observation, you can call it whatever you want to. They're not currencies. They're not currencies, period. The so currency has to be unit of account. Nothing is priced in Bitcoin. Everything is still priced in uh, dollars. It has to be a scalable means of payment. Uh, you can do five transactions per second with Bitcoin. You can do 50,000 transactions per second with Visa and all the fintech payment system, PayPal, Venmo, Square, Alipay, WeChat Pay, and Pesa, UPI are all the world. They're used by billions of people doing billions of transactions every day. Those are really means of payment, different from traditional uh, coins, uh, banknotes, and even bank deposits. So it's not a means of payment. Even the Bitcoin fanatic would say, no, it's never going to be used to buy goods and services. Uh, you buy Bitcoin to to sell an Ethereum and vice versa. So you exchange one coin for another. And uh, it's not a stable store of value. You know, the value of Bitcoin can fall overnight 10% or go up 10%, sometimes 20 So even in the conferences, blockchain and crypto, people like to be paid uh, in fiat. Because if you paid in Bitcoin and then the overnight price falls 10%, your entire profit margin is wiped out. And uh, something to be a currency has to be also a single numerator. We have to measure the relative price of bread for, say, milk by having a single numerator. If to buy every different good, you need a different token. That is the idea of tokenization. And I need a Coca-Cola coin to buy Coca-Cola and a Pepsi-Cola coin to buy Pepsi-Cola. It's like barter. You can't even tell the relative price of the two. So you have two coins for two different goods. You need a single thing, you know. As I said, even the Flintstone, or Stone Age are the better and more advanced uh, monetary system than the crypto because you had a single numerator. They were using stones, but that stone, you can say, uh, you know, piece of meat, a pound of meat is uh, two stones, and a pound of bread is uh, half a stone. So you had a single numerator, even if it was a stone rather than a traditional currency. But uh, in crypto, you go to barter. You cannot even tell what's the reality price. So you can call them whatever you want to. They are not currencies. Calling them a currency, anybody who knows anything of monetary theory or banking or money, calling them a currency is a joke. There are four attributes of money. They don't have one, let alone two, three, or four. Not even a single one. How can you call it a currency? It's a joke. Yeah. 
um, sh- shit coins as you've called them in the past. Um, one well, final- shit coins is an, is an offense to manure. The manure is actually fertilizers and it's productive in agriculture. Well, these shit coins are toxic and the electricity use uh, uh, destroys the planet. So it's actually it's an offense to call them shit coins because shit is useful, but these things are toxic. So I apologize yeah. for calling them shit coins because oh, manure, well, I is said actually, <laughs> manure is a fertilizer, so you That's can make true. use of them That's for true. agriculture. Well, these are toxic, so it's um, an offense to manure to call them offense shit. to manure. One final question, Noriel. Um, you and I were talking before this, and you've been traveling all over the world, which is why we're so grateful for your time today. And I know you have more travel ahead of you. Is there an interesting theme or anything that's been standing out to you in your conversation as you've been travel in your conversations as you've been traveling that might be interesting to the audience? Just I'm so curious. Well, you know, my last week before I came back to New York after five weeks, I was in Davos, where every year, of course, you have the World Economic Forum. It's interesting because the wife you are supposed to have the smartest people in the world, but the zeitgeist or conventional wisdom of the of the wife is always uh, wrong. When in 2006 and seven I said we'll have a global financial crisis, people are laughing, got it wrong. And when in 2016 the Chinese stock market fallen by 20 percent, everybody says hard landing. I remember January 16, hard landing of China, asking me we'll have another global financial crisis. I said no. You're not going to have a hard landing, you're not going to have a soft landing. It's going to be bumpy, but they have ways of managing it. And two or three years ago, the entire promenade in Davos was crypto, blockchains, and shit coins. Those went bust. Last year was all lean, clean, and green hydrogen. That was another bubble that has not gone anywhere. This year was all about AI. Now, I don't think AI, I think AI is going to change the world. But uh, most of the conversation in Davos was about the Gen AI. It's essentially LLMs that allow you to, you know, figure out text and so on, the chat GPTs of the world. But, you know, the revolution in uh, AI is going to be first, not just text, but also video, voice, images, whatever not. And two, the biggest revolution is occurring this year, but people don't seem to be aware is that until recently, Robotic and automation was very hard. There were these industrial machines that do just mechanical things. So you call them a robot, but they're doing just one task. Right now, using AI and using a machine, you're creating robots that are like humans. Their, their hands, their feet. You can go on the floor of a factory and do everything. You can go in a kitchen, you can wash, you can clean, you can cook, you can chop. Uh, you can be a chef, you can be whatever not. That's really how going to completely revolutionized because a lot of our manufacturing is still using machines. And until now, doing really robots that can do everything. You have a robot that can be a construction worker, can do anything from carpentry to bricklaying and so on. That's that's a huge revolution. So I think the fad was that everybody was talking 90% about Gen AI. Gen AI is interesting, important and so on, but it's not going to be the biggest thing in, in AI. So again, people... In Davos, go for the conventional wisdom because, you know, for last year, you open any piece of newspaper or TV or media, everybody saying Gen AI, Gen AI, Gen AI. Uh, open, open AI, chat GPT, and blah, blah, blah. It's interesting, it's important, but AI is much bigger than that. So that's a lesson. Don't follow the conventional wisdom, whether it's in Davos or it's somewhere else. Usually conventional wisdom is always backward-looking rather forward-looking. You look at the past and you see a trend and you say it's going to continue in the same way. And sometimes trend changes. And that's the art of understanding what's changing in the future as opposed to the past repeating itself in the near or farther future. Well, Noriel Rabini, I just want to thank you for being so generous with your time, your ideas, all of your knowledge, your lessons. Really appreciate you because you're helping all of us learn and get better. And it's great to see you as always. Thanks again, Noriel. A great pleasure. Thanks for having me again.